é uma satisfação muito grande para mim uh, estar com vocês hoje, Juan, Alejandro e toda a equipe do World Justice Project, para apresentar à imprensa brasileira o próprio World Justice Project, e em especial os resultados deste ano do Rule of Law Index. Muito se fala sobre Estado de Direito, uh, todos desejam o Estado de Direito, mas poucos sabem efetivamente no que ele consiste, quais são os componentes que podem atestar a efetiva adesão de um país a um regime de Estado de Direito. A necessidade, justamente a necessidade de mapear esta aderência ao Estado de Direito é que levou à iniciativa de criação de uma metodologia estatística que permitisse verificar e verificar com exatidão, de forma objetiva, se os países cumprem de fato as suas promessas de assegurar que todos sejam iguais perante a lei. O respeito efetivo ao Estado de Direito reduz a corrupção, combate a pobreza, assegura melhor acesso aos serviços de saúde, protege, enfim, os indivíduos contra grandes e pequenas injustiças. Ele também facilita o desenvolvimento, a responsabilização dos governantes e o respeito aos direitos fundamentais. Sem Estado de Direito, não é possível pensar em comunidades que promovam de, de verdade a paz, a justiça e a igualdade de oportunidades para todos. Por isso é que o World Justice Project vem se dedicando desde 2006 a essa tarefa de reunir, de coletar e de processar dados para uma, uma avaliação objetiva do Estado de Direito em cada país. O World Justice Project é uma organização não governamental, é uma organização sem fins lucrativos, independente e multidisciplinar. A sua missão é justamente coletar dados, produzir conhecimentos, construir a consciência e estimular iniciativas que ao redor do mundo possam estimular a aderência ao Estado de Direito. O projeto inicial teve a sua origem na American Bar Association, então sob a presidência de Bill Newcomb, e hoje está espalhado pelo mundo com escritórios em Singapura, em, na Cidade do México e também em Seattle e Washington. As preocupações com o Estado de Direito sempre foram vistas como algo que só interessava a advogados e magistrados. No entanto, essas questões dizem respeito a cada um de nós, cidadãos. O tema é para todos nós e merece a nossa atenção. O Rule of Law Index, que vocês vão conhecer hoje, através da exposição do Alejandro Ponce, que é o nosso pesquisador-chefe, ele é, produz esse resultado. Ele é uma ferramenta importantíssima para planejadores, para é, entidades governamentais e também para investidores porque efetivamente a existência ou não de um Estado de Direito com imprensa livre, com uh, leis bem elaboradas, com respeito à Constituição, é algo que os investidores estrangeiros buscam avaliar quando querem aplicar as, os seus recursos em algum país. O, o fato de uh, fazer essa atividade estatística não é a única atividade do World Justice Project, ao contrário, há muitas, inúmeras outras atividades, e eu convido vocês todos a participarem e, e acessarem o site da organização para verem a quantidade de projetos que são ali desenvolvidos ou estimulados. Um desses projetos, em especial para nós brasileiros, eu gostaria de chamar a atenção foi um projeto que recebeu, ainda nesse ano de 2022, o prêmio World Justice Project Rule of Law Award. Trata-se de uma premiação entregue à rede Waiuri, é uma rede de comunicadores indígenas do, do Amazonas uh, e, e diversas etnias, que produz 
em cinco línguas indígenas, além de português, informação útil àquelas comunidades. Por, por último, foi especialmente interessante que eles tenham divulgado a uh, informação correta, desfazendo outras uh, menos uh, adequadas a respeito da Covid-19, mas a sua atuação não é limitada a um, um só aspecto. Eles também cuidam da floresta e informam a respeito de ameaças à selva brasileira. Então, este é um exemplo de um projeto que, no início deste ano, foi premiado pelo World Justice Project. Mas existem inúmeros desses projetos ao redor do mundo e eu gostaria muito que vocês dedicassem algum tempo para conhecê-los. Por isso, tudo é uma satisfação para mim, que estou no projeto desde os seus primórdios. É um prazer muito grande trazer para o conhecimento mais amplo uh, dos brasileiros, em especial da imprensa brasileira, este, este grande trabalho já desenvolvido, e queremos contar com o apoio de vocês para sua divulgação. Ah, as, justamente a, a, a liberdade de imprensa é um dos tópicos, é um dos fatores uh, que bem uh, define a existência ou não de Estado de Direito. Mas eu quero lembrar a vocês que a liberdade de expressão corresponde a um outro dever, a um dever da própria imprensa, o dever de tornar acessível ao cidadão a informação correta. Nesses tempos de fake news, a posição de vocês, a defesa intransigente do bom jornalismo é extremamente importante. Nós contamos com vocês. Muito obrigada, Juan. Devolvo a você. Muito obrigado, Juíza Norflitch, por suas reflexões. Agora, o doutor Alessandro Ponce fará uma apresentação sobre as descobertas do Índice do Estado de Direito. Por favor, Alejandro. Thank you very much, Juan. I'm going to speak in English, so the uh, translation, uh, the interpretation. Uh, button is there. Thank you very much, Juan, and thank you, uh, Justice Norfleet, for providing the context um, of, the, of the index. As uh, Justice Norfleet was uh, talking about, the index is a quantitative tool uh, that measures uh, rule of law around the world. We do that through eight indicators or factors um, that measure essentially the uh, just the uh, whether Uh, the different parties in society are constrained, the power of different parties are constrained. So, and we do that through eight factors, which are constraints on government powers or checks and balances, absence of corruption, open government, fundamental rights, order and security, regulatory enforcement, civil justice, and criminal justice. Each one of these indicators are further disaggregated into what we call so factors, which are um, outcomes that rule of law societies want to achieve. For example, when we talk about the civil justice system, uh, we talk, uh, we investigate whether it's accessible, efficient, effectively enforced, uh, free of discrimination, free of corruption, etc. So all of these uh, indicators are populated with data that we draw from the assessments of the public and experts in each one of the countries that we include in the index. This year's index includes 140 countries. And in each of the countries, we interview a thousand people of the general public. We ask questions that uh, then we map to these indicators. And we also interview uh, lawyers, practicing attorneys in civil justice, criminal justice, labor law, and also some experts in public health. So we put together all that information is comparable, more than 550 questions that we use to produce the scores of the rule of law index. Um, All this information is available in country profiles that you can check uh, online. Uh, you can see the website there, as well as the QR code, the information uh, for all the different indicators uh, across countries and through the years is available, it's available on the website. I invite you to check the information for Brazil. And I'm going to, uh, just before that, I'm just the index obviously has been used by a lot of different audiences. This is a as Justice Norfolk was uh, mentioning. So this is just an example of some of the organizations that have used the index in the past. 
either governments, multi multilateral organizations, media, or businesses to contextualize uh, uh, findings and to uh, show uh, the weaknesses and strengths of different countries. So before going into the situation of Brazil, let me just give you uh, in three minutes, just a very brief um, introduction to some of the trends that we have seen in this year report that was published uh, a few weeks ago. So the first one is that we are seeing that uh, around the world, the rule of law has been declining. Over the previous year, uh, the rule of law declined in 61% of the countries around the world. You can see the countries and uh, the percentage that changed as compared to previous year. Uh, so that means that out of the 140 countries, in 85, approximately 4.1 billion people that live in countries where the rule of law declined as compared to previous year. The main factors that can explain this trend, well, there are three. So the first one is a decline in the checks on government power. So these are checks and balances. So legislative constraints, judicial constraints, uh, freedom of the media, uh, elections. So this indicator fell in 58% of the countries between 2021 and 2022. The next one is uh, respect for fundamental rights that includes uh, fundamental freedoms, such as freedom of opinion and expression, freedom of assembly, um, uh, and, and others. And this indicator fell in 66% of the countries last year, last year, driven mainly by increasing discrimination, a, um, a, a problems with access, and increased delays, as well as weak enforcement. So if we look at this over the long term, um, just we have been collecting information for several years, so we're able to see how the countries have been behaving or over the uh, current years, so from 2015 to 2022, 64% of the countries experienced a decline in rule of law scores. If we look at this over the years, uh, in red, you can see the percentage of countries where the rule of law declined, and in blue, the percentage of countries where the rule of law in Improved. This figure, as you can see, the last year with the pandemic, um, just the number of countries where rule of law declined was the highest, so 74%. So this year, the number of countries declined, however, is still larger than the number of countries that uh, improved. Indeed, some of the countries where the rule of law declined last year declined again, and the change was actually more pronounced than in those countries um, that were not declined. So let me just go now to some of the trends that we are observing in, in Brazil. So first off, um, Brazil ranks 81 out of 140 countries in rule of law. And out of the countries in Latin America that you can see in the graph, Brazil ranks 18 out of 32 in rule of law. So you can see Brazil just in the middle of the table and showed a 1.2% decline last year and uh, decreased four position, uh, positions in the index. So this is the country profile. What you can see here is the score for each one of the factors, uh, as well as the overall score, the regional ranking, the income group ranking, and the global ranking that I mentioned before. As I said, uh, Brazil declined by 1.2% or 0 0.01 in a scale between 0 and 1, declined four positions uh, in the global ranking. And you can see uh, just the, the different rankings for each one of the different uh, indicators. Uh, two uh, um, just are uh, important to highlight that I will uh, go in deeper, which is order and security and criminal justice where Brazil uh, scored uh, as compared to the other factors, the, the lowest and the one that scored the highest is in open government, just uh, six in the region and 41 over 140 globally. So when we look at um, Brazil over time, so the changes between 2015 and 2022, 
So as we have seen just over the years, Brazil has been declining for uh, essentially since 2016 in the rule of law uh, scores. Last year, the decline was less than uh, 2%, but in the previous years, it was above 2.5%. Uh, and overall, when we look at the whole picture over the last few years, Brazil is one of the countries in which the rule of law has declined uh, the most over the previous years. And there are three uh, factors that I would like to highlight. The first one is uh, an authoritarianism trend, a rising authoritarianism trend. So this is the uh, uh, indicators for uh, factor one that I mentioned, checks and balances or constraints on government powers that during the previous years have been declining almost in the magnitude of 5%. In some years, last year was not as pronounced, um, but during the pandemic, just the decline was considerable. When we look at the different components of this indicator uh, that you see uh, here, for example, these four indicators are uh, institutional constraints. So the first one is legislative constraints, 1.1. The second one is judicial constraints, 1.2. Uh, then 1.3 is constraints by independent auditing and review. And then 1.4 is sanctions for misconduct. What that means is that effectively, the institutions, the checks and balances effectively can constrain the power of the executive. And what we have seen in those indicators is that over the previous years, particularly legislative and judicial constraints have been declining, uh, particularly during the previous uh, years. Also independent audit and review and importantly sanctions for misconduct, that indicator has been declining importantly for more than 10 percent points in some cases. So this uh, trend is also shown when we look at fundamental rights. Uh, this indicator essentially measures a lot of fundamental freedoms. And as I mentioned before, has been declining. Last year, decline was very small, but over the previous year was considerable. And these are some of the uh, drivers of this uh, decline. So the first one is uh, decline in absence of discrimination or increase in discrimination. Uh, freedom of uh, opinion and expression that has been declining for several years. Last year showed a small improvement, but still just some declines over the previous year. Freedom of assembly and association, uh, a similar picture, and labor rights that uh, declined considerably during the previous year. Still just a small improvement last year, but just coming from a negative trend. And finally, just uh, uh, something that is uh, worth mentioning, the transition of power subject to the law, which is essentially just the confidence in the election system, checks and balances of the electoral system, um, uh, access to ballot and so on. Uh, so that indicator declined, but just uh, in 2000, between 2015 and 2018, but then during the last three years, this indicator has been improving and recently just improved as well, almost by, Five percent. This all this information was collected. Uh, just the, the data collection stopped uh, just at, at in July, essentially. So June, July. So this doesn't uh, include the most recent elections, but the trends that led to the elections are included here. Second big challenge of Brazil is violence. As we have seen, just uh, as I showed you before, Brazil ranks 108 and of 140 in order and security that measures uh, essentially a crime, civil conflict that is not, not an issue in Brazil, but uh, absence of violent redress. And then in the criminal justice system, which is uh, part of the institutions in charge uh, just of um, addressing the, the or, or um, the part of the, the, the crime problem, uh, so we can see that uh, criminal justice ranks 112 out of 140 countries, um, mainly driven by um, just effective investigations, timely and effective adjudication. What you can see are the scores over there. And in the orange and green light lines are uh, the scores for countries in Latin America or countries of, um, with similar income levels. So in the case of Brazil, upper middle income countries correctional system, no discrimination, due process of law. So those are areas that uh, need attention. Just the, 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 uh, on the other hand, the criminal justice system is perceived as uh, having uh, little improper government influence uh, just uh, or performing better as compared to other countries in the region. And in corruption is essentially just on par with other countries 
uh, in the region, but performing better than the other categories of that we measure in criminal justice. Uh, finally, the third one is corruption. Obviously, this is an, an ongoing uh, trend, particularly in the executive, the judiciary performs better than uh, other countries with the same income level or in the region, uh, the same in the police and the military, the scores are relatively high as compared to, to other countries. However, corruption in the executive or in the legislature uh, is seen as high. And we, when we look at the trends over time, we have seen that uh, just uh, corruption, the scores have been uh, decreasing over the previous years. Finally, uh, civil justice. Uh, and civil justice just following a, a trend, I mean, that, that we have seen in other parts of the world. So the, the indicators on delays, continued delays and weak enforcement is uh, two areas in which uh, the country uh, still needs to improve. On the other hand, the indicator on accessibility and no corruption uh, is much higher than those in the region or with similar income levels. Muito obrigado pela apresentação, uh, ah, perdão. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, Juan, uh, just what I was saying is just simply comparing the two scores, 2016 to 2022, just, uh, just Brazil obviously has declined uh, in almost all categories. Uh, so even though in some categories has been improving, but in, for the most part, just has been declining over the previous year. And I will stop here, Juan. Sim, muito obrigado, Alejandro, por la apresentação. Eh, agora, eu quero fazer um, uh, um pequeno uh, mensagem, um, uma pequena precisão. Uh, a minha colega, Lauren, ela... Uh, 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 é só um anúncio rápido. Você pode encontrar um convite para o evento de amanhã no chat dessa sessão Zoom. Uh, no chat, uh, por favor. Uh, muito obrigado, Alejandro. Uh, Ex-ministra Ellen Gracie, como abogada no Brasil, quais são suas impressões sobre os resultados do índice do Estado de Direito no Brasil? Obrigada, Juan. Obrigada, Alejandro, pela excelente apresentação. I'm sorry, but I have to, to mute, mute the interpreter here, I believe. And I'm not doing that. Interpretation off. Okay. I think, uh, eu acho que agora estamos bem. Um, Alejandro, uh, eu gostei muito da sua apresentação, mas eu acredito que o público brasileiro, especialmente os nossos amigos jornalistas, gostariam muito de saber um pouco sobre a metodologia que nós empregamos no índice porque todos nós sabemos, os, os jornalistas melhor do que nós, que estatística é uma ciência que pode ser, muitas vezes, uh, utilizada de forma indevida. Então, uh, nós temos aqui uma análise de percepção, a análise uh, de percepção da população a respeito desses diversos fatores, desses diversos aspectos. Uh, explique para nós como é feito isso, como são aplicados questionários a uh, entrevistados em geral e depois como esse resultado é tabulado e submetido a uma equipe de, de especialistas, uh, de acadêmicos, para que possam efetivamente uh, chancelar os resultados obtidos pelos números brutos. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question, Justice. Yes. Um, the way that we uh, gather the, the data collection is, is as follows. First, we have um, identified, so as I mentioned, there are two different data sources. So one is um, data from uh, the general public. So these are uh, surveys that we conduct all around the world. It's the same questionnaire, usually every three uh, years. So it varies the periodicity that we, uh, where we uh, collect the, the data. This is to anchor some of the results uh, that we have so that uh, it also shows some of the um, perceptions from the public. So to the public, we ask questions about, let's say perceptions of corruptions or the experience that they have had paying a bribe or whenever they have a problem accessing the justice system or perceptions that they may have about 
uh, just the performance of the, of the government. Then we supplement all that information with information from experts or practicing attorneys. So for that, we have identified all around the world um, lawyers, just that uh, we have a database for, of more than 35,000 uh, lawyers all around the world, and we invite them to participate and to fill out a questionnaire. Essentially that questionnaire, so we identify uh, experts in civil law, criminal law, labor law, and public health, and we uh, invite them to answer the questionnaires. The questionnaires ask questions about the, in most cases, things that the public may not know. So uh, let's say, for example, the performance of the justice system. So uh, the questions that we ask the public are very limited in that regard. It's mainly the lawyers who we are asking the questions to, uh, because the people may not know, for example, the performance of the criminal justice system. But the criminal attorneys actually know how uh, it is performing. How by them to participate ourselves? Uh, in the case of Brazil, it's a very large number of experts who answer the questionnaire. Um, and then we combine all those questions, remove outliers, because there's always uh, people who think that their country is the best, that their country is the worst, we remove those, and then uh, organize information and check all that information against uh, other sources, uh, third party sources uh, from all around the world, both quantitative and qualitative human rights reports and so on, to um, verify some of the, uh, just whether we didn't make any mistakes in the process of collecting the data. Uh, and then we put all that information together to come up with a score. So we're all there are about 550 questions. So then when we talk, for example, as I was mentioning, the scores of criminal justice, those scores are built with almost 100 questions. So that touch all the different aspects, let's say, of the, of, of the criminal justice uh, procedure. So uh, when we talk about due process, for example, we have a lot of questions to really understand all the different circumstances and, and, and rights uh, and that the processes are followed. So uh, to try to make the indicators as uh, robust as, as possible. So uh, obviously just vary just by, uh, by the theme, uh, just but uh, overall, these are more than 550 questions that we combine. So check and uh, use to produce the scores. So, uh, that we publish every year. So the intention is that this report is published every year so that uh, we can track changes uh, over time and see how the, the situation is, is going. Uh, indeed, when we talk to experts, we often, uh, for those who have answered over several years, we show them the responses that they provided the previous year so that they, they can assess whether the country uh, on a particular issue is improving or not. Muito obrigada, Alejandro. Uh, mais uma pergunta que eu queria lhe dirigir é a seguinte. Uh, quantos países atualmente estão cobertos pelo índice e o que, que isso representa no total da população mundial? Yes, the, we currently cover um, 140 countries. That's about 95% of the world's population. So the index has been growing over the years, but just uh, it has been uh, during the recent years, it has covered uh, just more than 95% of the of the world's population is really just the small countries that we still need to, to cover. Oh, I think you're muted. É, darmos algum espaço para outras perguntas do público que nos acompanha. Sim, sí, ainda temos alguns minutos. Eu gostaria de abrir o um briefing para qualquer pergunta da mídia. Você pode fazer uma pergunta usando a função de levantar a mão no Zoom, por favor. Alex. Uh, essa nossa metodologia, que é utilizada já há alguns anos, passou por revisão uh, de instituições internacionais importantes no campo da estatística. 
É, você poderia nos dar uma, uma notícia a respeito disso? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, so this is a methodology that we uh, uh, developed a few years ago, and as as you mentioned first, we uh, check the the conceptual framework to begin, just to see whether we're uh, capturing all the different elements. Obviously, new issues have arise over the years that we uh, probably need to to pay more attention to, uh, but uh, but overall is consistent that covers most of the dimensions that we consider rule of law, and then. Uh, from the statistical point of view, uh, we check uh, regularly, I would say every three years, uh, the index is subject to an audit by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. So uh, essentially what they do is just they uh, analyze the index scores and, and all possible uh, assumptions that we have and play with the assumptions to see whether the rankings will change, for example, if we change the assumptions. and. Uh, the results are that the results are quite robust uh, because of the high number of questions that we have. So if a country, uh, we say that ranks in a certain position, just the, just with 95% uh, confidence ranks either one above or one below. Sí, eu tenho uma pergunta uh, de Manuel Alcântara, Alcântara, por favor. Olá, boa tarde, ministro. Boa tarde a todos que participam. Vocês conseguem me ouvir? Oi, boa tarde. Eu queria entender melhor um pouco essa posição do Brasil, pelo que eu entendi, é que o Brasil estaria em 81º lugar. Queria entender melhor esses oito pontos que foram colocados e como que a gente chegou até essa pontuação e se é pior do que o ano anterior. Alex, essa é para você. O Brasil está na posição 81 uh, em relação ao total uh, dos países, 140 países que são avaliados. Realmente uh, houve um declínio desde o ano passado e tem havido um declínio nos últimos cinco anos. Em, em diversos aspectos. Ah, o Alex mostrou algumas das, ah, algumas das conclusões ah, que podem ser tiradas ah, em relação ao índice. Ah, eu, há muito tempo, Alex, já tinha manifestado para você que ah, entendia talvez mais adequado nós criarmos um grupo especial do Caribe, porque tão logo as ilhas do Caribe entraram uh, junto com uh, os países sul-americanos, houve um decréscimo geral, na medida em que esses são países relativamente, necessariamente são muito pequenos, são bem mais uh, simples de administrar do que um país continente como o Brasil. Quando nós começamos a pesquisa, Alex, no primeiro ano, você deve se lembrar disso, eu fiz questão de revisar o questionário, porque eu temia que uma tradução menos uh, exata uh, com relação à terminologia jurídica ou mesmo as palavras uh, que são parecidas nas, nas duas línguas, mas têm significados diferentes, pudesse afetar o, a exatidão da pesquisa. E, desde então, a gente tem visto, naquela época, o Brasil só era, no primeiro ano, só era inferior ao Uruguai, entre os países da América do Sul. Depois disso, ficamos, após as, as classificações do Uruguai e do Chile, e, atualmente, nós estamos numa posição intermediária na América Latina, ou seja... Manuela, isso é uma demonstração de que os resultados estatísticos estão aí para serem analisados, para serem colocados em contexto. Não quer dizer que seja, e esta é exatamente a função do índice, não é uma função de apontar este ou aquele país como menos... Uh, merecedor do, do, do nosso apoio e da, 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 
da nossa admiração, mas sim possibilitar que os pesquisadores e que especialmente os planejadores de uma mesma região uh, geográfica ou econômica, eles possam utilizar-se dos bons exemplos que encontram em países talvez vizinhos ou talvez uh, com que mantenham relações próximas e em determinados setores. Vamos imaginar, a nossa uh, justiça criminal, não é, Alex? Está num ponto uh, muito alto, muito elevado. No entanto, ao que parece, uh, o, nosso, o nosso sistema de uh, investigação uh, dos delitos, esse já não está tão bem. Uh, para o, o, o administrador e para o planejador brasileiro, seria muito interessante verificar que outros países já efetuaram progressos nesta área e buscar, talvez, estratégias que nos possam servir para melhorar os nossos serviços. Assim também em outros aspectos uh, que dizem respeito ao... ao a aderência ao Estado de Direito em geral, respeito aos direitos humanos, a, a garantia de livre manifestação, etc. Muito obrigado, Juíza. Uh, alguma outra pergunta de, de jornalistas? Alejandro, você quer uh, dizer alguma outra coisa da pergunta? Um, no, I think the, the Justice Northfleet uh, summarized uh, pretty well the, 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 the question. So it's... Uh, It's a uh, the uh, Caribbean islands, but it has been declining over the, the previous years. 